Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles, please, to the book of John. The book of John, we're going to be eventually in the 14th chapter of John, but you can't get to John chapter 14 without starting in John chapter 13. You have to remember that when you change chapters, you don't necessarily change thinking, you don't necessarily change the story. It doesn't stop at the end of chapter 13 and continue on in chapter 14. Sometimes that causes us to misinterpret a passage of Scripture, and John 14 is one of those passages of Scripture. To understand John chapter 13, you have to start in the upper room with Jesus. There is Jesus and just the twelve disciples. There are no Pharisees, there are no Sadducees, there are no chief priests. The high priest, Caiaphas and Annas, they're not there. None of the Roman people are there, just Jesus and the twelve that had followed him for three solid years. The twelve that he had individually called. And in this upper room, after they have eaten and after he has washed their feet, Jesus begins to give them all the bad news. I want you to notice what the Bible says in John 13. Look with me please at verse 21. When Jesus had thus, uh, had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now I realize we are all so smart, we are all so theological, we have all been church members for so long, that you and I are actually under the impression that if you were in that upper room, or I were in that upper room, and Jesus said, one of you shall betray me, that we would have all sat there and pointed like this, at Judas. We'd have cleared our throats and said, <coughs> like that, and pointed to Judas. We would have had it all figured out. But it'll surprise you to know that none of the disciples had it figured out. Even after Jesus seemingly gives them a clue that everyone should have gotten, they still can't figure it out. Skip down, please, to verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. Now watch this. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had sent unto him, by those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. I have a little bit of a ring up here. If we could turn that down just a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Even after Judas gets up and leaves, no one in the room, no man, knew why Judas left. In other words, what you now have in that room, now that Judas is gone, is Jesus and 11 disciples that all think they could be the betrayer. They know the betrayer was, was in the room. They don't think Judas was the betrayer, so the betrayer must still be in the room. As a matter of fact, as you read the four gospel accounts, you'll find that every one of them, except Judas, actually asked the Lord, Lord, is it I? Every one of them thought they could be the betrayer. Now you have 11 men in this room with the Son of God, 11 men who are carrying the burden of knowing that it is possible that they are, in fact, the betrayer. Now, it gets worse, though. Even after that, the Bible says in verse 33, Jesus continued to speak, little, little children, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me, and as I said to the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say unto you. I do want to point out that two-letter word, go. Jesus isn't talking about going to Pilate. He is not talking about going to the grave. He's talking about going to the cross. He says this, yet a little while, I am with you. They've had him for three years. If there was a demon they couldn't cast out, they would bring him to Jesus and Jesus would cast it out. If there was a question they couldn't answer, then they would bring it to Jesus and Jesus would answer it. If there was a parable they couldn't understand, they would ask Jesus and he would explain it. If there was a storm they couldn't conquer, they could just look up and see him walking toward them or waking up in the boat and saying, Peace be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed him. For three years they've had unfettered access to the Son of God. And now he says, listen... Yet a little while, I am with you. Now you have 11 men in this room. All of them think they might be the betrayer. Every one of them knows that Jesus is leaving. They've been apart from him for brief times before, have they not? Remember, after he'd fed the 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes, the Bible says he went up onto a high mountain apart alone to pray and sent the disciples across the Sea of Galilee. They were apart when they went into the city of Samaria. Remember, Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And Jesus sits down and talks to that woman at the well. The disciples go on into town and get something to eat. And they still don't understand. After they come back, after the woman at the well 
has gone and brought the whole town to Jesus. They still don't understand. And they say, Master, are you hungry? And he says, listen, I have meat to eat that you know not of. They've been apart before, but they've always been right back together. This time Jesus says, I'm leaving and you can't follow. Now, what do you have in this upper room? You have 11 men, each of them thinking they might be the betrayer. All of them knowing that they're going to lose their master. All of them knowing that this time it's not just going to be for a few hours. Notice then Simon Peter speaks up. It's as if Simon Peter finally is beginning to grasp at least the concept that Jesus is going to die. He speaks in verse 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. This is Peter. This is the loud mouth. This is the boldest of all the disciples. This is the first one to publicly proclaim him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the one that in a couple of hours is going to pull out his sword from his sheath and get ready to go into battle with one sword against 5,000 Roman soldiers. This is Peter we're talking about here. Jesus looks at him and says, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily I say unto thee, the co- verily, verily, I say to thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Now, we know that Jesus denied, th- uh, Peter denied thrice. We also know that in the scripture, he's the only one that denied. But this is not, this is future tense we're talking about here. He says, Peter, it's going to get so bad, you are going to deny me three times. What if your name is Thomas? What if you already have a tendency to doubt? How many times is Thomas going to deny How many times is Philip or Bartholomew or Thaddeus? How many times are all these other disciples going to deny? If it's going to get so bad that even Peter is going to deny, how bad is it going to be? Imagine you don't have to be the Son of God. You don't have to know the end from the beginning. You don't have to be omniscient. You could just look on their faces and see the concern. You could see the furrow in their brow as they realize that in this room, as far as they know, the betrayer is there. A denier is there, and everybody else is going to lose their master. And it's at that moment that Jesus speaks perhaps the sweetest words and the most dogmatic words that he ever spoke. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For a Christian especially a church that has gone through heartache over the course of the last few months. It's not very often that you stand in the pulpit where the last time you were there, the pastor sat beside of me right here. It's not very often you preach to a church that has just gone through the loss of the man that was directing them, the under-shepherd, the one to whom the Lord had given the flock to. Take heed also to the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Not often you preach in a church that is going through a time of transition. I know what's going to happen next Sunday. I'm excited for you about that. But I'm here to tell you, if you're a Christian and you're not going through John chapter 13 right now, you will soon. If you're a Christian, you you may be going through the throes of it right now. Maybe everybody knows about it. Maybe nobody knows about it. But you're carrying that John chapter 13 burden on your heart. I will tell you this, though, straight from the Word of God. For every John 13 moment in your life or in your church's life, John 14 is just right around the corner. Jesus is going to say, let not your heart be troubled. By the way, if you're a lost person... As far as I can tell in Scripture, in this passage of Scripture, we have literally the most dogmatic statement that Jesus ever made in His earthly ministry. The time He said something that cannot be interpreted away, that cannot be rewritten, that no one can say, well, I think what He meant to say is... No, no, it is so dogmatic and so forceful that I'll tell every lost person in this auditorium this morning, you have to come face to face with John chapter 14 and verse 6. Let's have a word of prayer before I preach a message entitled, If 
I go. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for our opportunity to be here at Central Baptist Church. Father, we want to leave everything that's going on outside, outside. But Father, just want to focus this morning on the Word of God. Have your will and your way. Father, we trust you to do that which is best for us throughout the course of this week. But for this service, Father, there's no hurricane this service. There's no weather this service. It's just God's people and some lost people sitting in a church building listening to the Word of God. Have your will and way in every heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice the first thing, the purpose of his going. Now, this is an often misinterpreted passage of Scripture. In a few weeks, I'll be in a town of Dover, Pennsylvania. A few years ago, I was in Dover, and I was standing over at our table, and this man came up to me, and he was smiling from ear to ear. Something I said in the message had brought this thought to his heart, and this is what he said. He said, you know, Brother Harper, what encourages me? I said, no, sir, tell me. He said, well, I look around, and I see all the splendor of God. God's creation and I see everything that's all around us and it certainly declares the glory of God he said but one thing that encourages me more than that is that God created all of that in six literal 24-hour periods but he's been working on my mansion for 2,000 years I have a preacher friend that literally preach, preaches a message, and he's a wonderful preacher. I'm not criticizing him. He, he preaches a message, and he describes Jesus as wearing a gold tool belt around his waist with a gold Stanley hammer and a gold tape measure on the other side as he's looking at blueprints building our mansions. See, you have to really stretch it to come up with that because Jesus begins this way. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, someday, if we get all the building permits and the weather cooperates and all the unions come together and we can get the sheetrock guy on time and the painters show up and the uh, roofers put the roof in. If we can get all the materials and we come in under budget, there will be some mansions someday. That's not what it says. I'm sorry. I don't mean to burst anybody's bubble. I mean, it says in my father's house are. That's 2,000 years ago. Many mansions. Jesus is not up in heaven as a foreman ordering angels on a construction crew building your mansion. Do you know when your mansion was built? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's been there for thousands of years. But trust me, God has an excellent maintenance program. And by the way, other people will call their, what they have in front of them a version of the Bible. It's either the Bible or it's not. I'm sorry. But their version, it says rooms or dwelling places. Let me just give you my stance here. When we get to heaven, you can stay in an NIV apartment complex. I'm living in a King James mansion when I get there. So what is Jesus going to do? He says, I go to prepare a place for you. The purpose of his going is to prepare us a place. But he's not talking about going to heaven. He's talking about going to a cross. See, on that cross, he prepared a place for us, didn't he? He prepared a place for us of relation. Remember in the, uh, in the Old Testament, God had a nation. He had a chosen people. He had the nation of Israel, the apple of his eye. That's what God had. If you were born into the nation of Israel, you were born into, into one, to be one of God's people. You were, if you had described yourself, you were the son of this person, the son of this person, the son of this person, of the tribe of this person. That's how you described yourself. But everything changed on that old rugged cross, didn't it? I don't, God doesn't have a, a people anymore. God has something else now. God has a family now. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even then that believe on his name. John chapter 1, 11 and 12. Or 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Understand, I'm no longer, I don't come to God and say, I am the son of, of the tribe of. I come to God and walk into his presence and I say, Abba, Father. I'm talking to my Heavenly Father. I'm not part of a nation now. I'm part of a family now. He prepared a place for us of relation. He prepared a place for us of approximation. 
(laughs) Think about this for just a moment. In the Old Testament, if you had a prayer request or a sacrifice that needed to be offered, you went to the tabernacle and later to the temple. You came to the outside gate. If you were allowed in, you waited outside, but most people waited outside of the gates of the tabernacle or the temple. They handed their sacrifice with their prayer request to a priest who took it inside and talked to God for them. He offered the sacrifice for them. He offered the sacrifice for the whole nation once a year in the Holy of Holies while you waited outside to see if God was pleased with your sacrifice, God had answered your prayer, or God had forgiven your sin. But I don't wait outside anymore. I don't stand outside and wait for some priest to talk to God for me. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. I don't wait out now and give it to a priest or a cleric or an imam or a bishop or a pope or anything like that. I don't wait outside and wait for someone else to talk to God for me. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I don't wait outside anymore. I walk. Walk right in. When did that happen? What specific moment? You know, we can almost pinpoint it scripturally to the exact instant that it took place. I think you can say the exact instant that it took place. The Bible says this on the cross, that he cried with a loud voice and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. I don't wait outside because he went to a cross. I don't come to him as a member of a nation. I come to him as a member of his family because he went to a cross. He prepared a place for me of relation, a place for me of approximation. He prepared a place for me, watch this one, of justification. Every other sacrifice was temporary. And almost all things were without the shedding of blood. Almost all things were by the shedding of blood. Uh, sorry, I lost that verse. And almost all things were purged by the uh, shedding of the blood. And without the shedding of the blood is no remission. It's remission. Talking about in the Old Testament. When that high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, and he took that male lamb of the second year without spot and without blemish, all of the nation of Israel would stand outside and watch and wait. Because if that priest did his job right and sacrificed that lamb the right way, and God was pleased, the Shekinah glory of God would fall on the Holy of Holies, and every single member of the nation of Israel would know that their sins for the whole previous year were forgiven. But if you lied five minutes later, you're stuck with that thing for 360 some days. Because there was never a sacrifice in the Old Testament that would forgive tomorrow's sin. There was never a sacrifice that would forgive anything in the future. But then the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12, but this man... After he had sacrificed one, uh, one, one time for sin, forever sat down at the right hand of God. It was one sacrifice that he gave. See, he didn't just die for all the past sins. He died for all the future sins. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. He died for every single sin that would ever be committed and had ever been committed. His blood was efficient to cover every single sin. All the wicked imagination of the human heart and all the temptations that Satan puts on us his blood was powerful enough to forgive every one of them come now let us reason together Though your sins be as scarlet, saith the Lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as snow well though they be as crimson they shall be as wool the fact is uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12. But I will have mercy in their unrighteousness and their sin and iniquity will I remember no more. He repeated that just two chapters later in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. But their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. He hath made him to be sin. He had made him to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I love that conversation that Paul has with himself when he says, Who shall delay anything to the charge of God's elect? Then he answers himself, It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died. Yea, rather is risen again, who is even at the right hand of the Father, who also maketh intercession for us. He goes on to say, What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He prepared a place for us of justification. Notice, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to a cross to prepare a place for you of relation, of approximation, and of justification. Notice the purpose of his going. Number two, then there's the promise of his going. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I might think about coming again. No, no. It doesn't say that. I will come again. I get so weary hearing people say, well, you Bible thumpers, you still believe he's coming back. It's been 2,000 years. Y'all been preaching that same message. He can come back any day. You've been preaching that for 2,000 years and he still hasn't come back. They just don't understand, do they? That with God, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. In the mind of God, Jesus just left Friday. It hasn't been a long time to him. If time doesn't matter, 2,000 years doesn't matter. All I know is he said he's coming back. The only simple biblical truth I'll give you about that, I'm not a date namer or anything like that, but I will tell you this, it is closer today than it was yesterday. He says, I will come again. Oh, Brother Harper, he's, I, I, I remember reading an article one time years ago, and I won't mention the name of the, it was a news website, a sort of news website. I won't mention the name of it. I will give you the initials, maybe. I don't want to, I don't re, want to re reveal who it is. I don't want you to have a negative opinion of them, but their initials are CNN. Okay, so I'm, I'm not going to tell you who it is. But th there was an article there, and I'm, I'm, I'm just reading along. I, 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 pr I probably haven't been to that website in 10 years now, but there was an article there written by the religion editor of CNN. I didn't know that CNN had a religion editor. I found out it was a female Episcopalian priest, so that made a whole lot more sense to me. But the article was entitled, Why Paul Invented the Rapture. I clicked on it. Of course, she misquoted the Word of God. She misapplied the Word of God. She took it completely out of context. She said, no, if we use common sense, while she's trying to refute the Word of God by using common sense, the Word of God isn't refuted by your common sense. I don't care who you are. Now, Paul did talk about the rapture, did he not? He talked about it a lot. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, uh, but he said, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice, the archangel, the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He certainly talked about it. He talked about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 51. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in a moment at the twinkle of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the, dead, and the dead, dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And this corruptible must put an incorruption and this mortal must put an immortality so that when this corruptible shall have put an incorruption and this mortal shall have put an immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory. <laughs> Paul talked about it a lot but he didn't make it up. You know, the first person in the New Testament to talk about the rapture of the church was none other than our Savior in this passage of Scripture. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He's not talking about the second coming when he's talking about coming back with us on a white charger to destroy the Antichrist and his armies. He's talking about the rapture. I'm going to come back and get you. It was just as sure when he said it then as it is right now. He is coming. It is the promise of Almighty God. The only if in this passage of Scripture is if I go. 
and he left 2,000 years ago. Number one, we saw the purpose of his going to prepare a place for us. Number two, the promise of his going. He's going to come back and get us. Number three, there's the peace of his going. Now, what if you get to heaven and find out that there's no real street of gold? It's just I-4. There's no real uh, wall of jasper. It's just a wall with green paint on it. The gates of pearl are just antique white. The crystal sea, (laughs) there's no crystal in it at all. It's just this regular old lake that you go fishing in on a regular basis. What if you get to heaven and find out all those things that we preach about heaven are allegorical? That God is saying, well, it's kind of, sort of like this and kind of like this and kind of like that. Would, Would you be disappointed? Don't answer the question. Years ago, I went to a camp in Rodney, Ontario, uh, in Canada. The camp is called Camp Yes, Y-E-S, Youth Excited About Salvation. They have four weeks of camp every year. The first week is the 16 through 18-year-olds. The second week is the 13 through 15. The third week is the, uh, the, uh, the 10 through 12s. And the last week is the 7 through 9s. And so they have four weeks of camp. Usually the first week is the smallest of the weeks because a lot of those kids are either in college or saving money or working or something like that. I was preaching the first two weeks, both teen weeks. And so uh, uh, before the first week of camp, they, the newly elected fire marshal for Rodney, Ontario, inspected the camp. He came away with the conclusion that we were all lucky to be alive. (laughs) That this camp was nothing but a tinderbox. One accidental spark could burn us all to the ground. He said he was going to close down the camp. This is a week before camp started. They they, uh, pled with him and begged him. They said, listen... You give us a list of all the things that need to be done. You let us stay open for these four weeks. You give us a list of everything you want done, and we'll make this the most fire-retardant camp in all of Canada if you'll just give us these four weeks. He said, I'll think about it. He left. He did let us have the first two weeks. By the way, after the second week, he showed up on Saturday, on Monday, when the campers, 125 campers, were set to arrive and shut them down. They had an hour to find another place to host camp. Anyway, so he said, now one thing that you can do that'll make me happy is if you don't use the second floor of any building anywhere in the camp. Well, that was fine. Uh, we, were, we shut down uh, the second floor of the chapel building and of the girls' dorm. Now, that meant we lost half of our girls' dorm space. The first week, though, there were 68 campers, 34 boys, 34 girls. 34 girls would fit on the ground floor. The boys were on the ground floor in the basement, so they had no problem. The second week, we had 115 campers coming in. 65 were girls. We weren't even close. So on the Saturday after all the campers left, they set up tents in the backyard. And when the girls got there on Monday, they found out that half of them were sleeping outside in a tent for a week. Now, a few of them were excited. They thought that was adventure sleeping. But then there were the others that got disappointed because you may not know this, but if you've ever had a teenage girl, teenage girls don't just want electricity. They don't just like electricity. They absolutely need electricity. My daughter used things that to this day completely baffle me. She had a curling iron to curl her straighten hair. Her straight hair. She had a straightener to straighten her curly hair. Now to me, that seems like it's an eternal job because as soon as you finish curling it, you would have to straighten it. Now it's straight, now you've got to curl it again. Now it's curly, now you've got to straighten it again. It seems like you would never leave the bathroom and that actually was relatively close on some days. (laughs) So if you got to heaven and found out that instead of a mansion, it's a Motel 6, but they left the light on for you. The walls weren't jasper and the gates weren't pearl and the street wasn't gold. Would you be disappointed? I I would understand you'd be disappointed with the incorrect preaching and teaching that you'd heard. But would you be disappointed? If the answer is yes, I'll give you a simple answer here. You don't know what heaven really is. See, heaven isn't heaven because of a wall or a street or a gate. Heaven isn't heaven because of what is there. Heaven is heaven because of who is there. The definition of heaven is in this passage of Scripture that where... I am. There you may be also. Brother Carpenter, I believe that we're going to be there for about the first 10,000 years. Kneeling at the throne, singing praises to Almighty God. And then one of us, I'm not sure which one, is going to look at the other and go, Hey, 
It is gold. By the way, since I know almost everything I say nowadays is out there on the internet somewhere, let me just stress for the, for the uh, audience here and for the audience at home, God knows what gold is. He didn't say the street was kind of, sort of like gold. He said the street of it is of purest gold. He knows what silver is. He knows what jasper is. He knows what pearls are. He knows what crystal is. He knows all of those things. He, he built a city up there for us where he uses the most precious things on planet Earth as asphalt and sheetrock and cast iron. That's how wonderful heaven's going to be. But the wonder of heaven is not that. The wonder of heaven is Him. Where I am, there you may be also. Listen, Christian, there is no trial that you and I will ever face that will go with us into heaven. There is no heartache that will walk with us on that street of gold. Understand, it all goes away. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because the purpose of his going, to prepare a place for you, of relation, approximation, and justification. The promise of his going, I will come again. Number three, the peace of his going, where I am, there you may be also. Whether you're going through John 13 now, or whether it's coming tomorrow, or whether it's coming Wednesday. John 14 is still in the Bible. Now, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, Thomas speaks up. Now, he is not questioning, he is not doubting here. He doesn't understand. Let's cut Thomas a little break, if you will. By the way, do you know why 2,000 years, years later, Thomas is still called Doubting Thomas? He missed one Sunday. That's not a joke, that's not hyperbole. He was not there when the first Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. And he said, I'm not going to believe that he rose from the dead until I stick my fingers in the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand into his side. He was back the next Sunday from vacation or wherever. And Jesus walks in. He holds out his hands. And Thomas didn't stick his fingers in the hands. He fell down at his feet and said, My Lord and my God. But Thomas is going to speak here. He's just asking a question. Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? And then Jesus gives this unbelievably straightforward, dogmatic answer. I am the way. He doesn't say, I am a way. I'm part of the way. You put me and something else and you can have the way. No, he says, I am the way. The one and the only way. There is no way to reinterpret that. There's no way to say, well, Jesus meant to say that it was religion and he was part of... No, I am the way. There is no way to salvation without Jesus Christ. Oh no, Brother Harper, I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments. No, you're not. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. I do not frustrate. The, uh, uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 actually says, if, uh, 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 no, By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Sorry about that. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21 is the one I started to quote. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. No. I'll do good deeds. No. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. It's not of good deeds, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is one way. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough good deeds. Oh, but Brother Harper, all these religions teach good deeds. Let me tell you something about every single religion that teaches good deeds will take you to heaven. None of them tell you how many. You won't find it written anywhere. It's 500 good deeds that takes you to heaven. It's a thousand good deeds that take you to heaven. It's a million good deeds that take you to heaven. There is only one belief system on our planet that will tell you exactly, exactly how many good deeds you have to do to, go, to get to heaven. And that's Bible-believing Christians. Because the answer is this number here. Zero. To assume that good deeds will take you to heaven is to assume that you can do a good deed. Isaiah 64 and verse 6, all of our righteousness as, our good deeds, are as filthy rags. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. Oh, there's lots of truths out there, Brother Harper. The truth is, everybody wants to find their own path to God. 
People are always talking about truth. They always define truth in kinds of different ways. I remember years ago, there was a lady or a woman that had a, a television program. And, and, and some people probably still remember her. I mean, she uh, uh, garnered some sort of fame every now and then. I, I don't know. I'll just ask, how many of you in this room have ever heard of a woman by the name of Oprah Winfrey? You ever heard of her? Most of you have? Well, that's good. I didn't know that. But, but she had this thing called the Oprah Book of the Month Club. And she had a, a guy come in there that was an author, had written a book about his own, it was his own autobiography, about all the crimes he'd committed, the people he'd hurt, the things he'd stolen, just to supply his own raging drug habit. Everybody in the audience was moved to tears. It went to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. People were flocking to this book. After a few weeks, a few reporters did what reporters used to do. They actually searched for the truth. They found out that in the book, he specifically, this was the first chink in the armor, he talked about going to being in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he gave the date and the time in Cincinnati, Ohio, that he beat up with his own hands six police officers that were trying to arrest him when he was strung out on drugs. The trouble was, on that date and at that time, he really did get in trouble with the law in Cincinnati, Ohio. He had parked his car, put a quarter in the meter, leaned his seat back, and was taking a nap. He slept so long, the meter expired. So on the, at the day and the time that he was supposedly beating up six police officers, he was getting a parking ticket. How do you lie in your own autobiography? They began to find out that almost everything in the book was false. Everybody was embarrassed. Oprah, who didn't write the book, actually issued a public statement. It said this, uh, I, I realize that many of the statements made in the book have been proven to be untrue. However, the emotional truth of the book is still there. I had it. That was it. I was done. I sat down and did what every red-blooded American did at that time. Right now, if I read something like that, I would post something on Facebook or Instagram or X or something like that, right? But back then, a few years ago, I sent an email. I said, dear Miss Winfrey, I am very disappointed in you. There is no such thing as emotional truth. Everything is either true or it's false. It's right or it's wrong. It's holy or it's wicked. There is no such thing as emotional truth. Sincerely, Richard Harper, and then I hit send. I felt so good about myself. All the, tr all the pressures of the world went away because I sent an email. A few weeks went by and they began to announce that this author was coming back on Oprah's show. Everybody was talking about it. I, I was out playing golf. She was coming on Monday. I was out playing golf on Saturday with Pastor Wayne Seacrest in Salisbury, North Carolina. My phone rang. It was a phone call from Chicago, Illinois. Now, as an evangelist, I've got to take calls even if I don't recognize the phone number. And so I answered it. And the lady said, is this Richard Harper? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. Who wants to know? She said, I am. And she gave me her name. I'm one of the executive producers of the Oprah Winfrey Show. I had forgotten about the email, to be honest with you, because all of my pressure had gone away when I wrote it. She said, uh, you may know this. She said, do you watch the show? And I said, no, ma'am, I've actually never seen your show. I think my wife has seen it a time or two. She learned how to fold fitted sheets from an Oprah Winfrey show. And she's, if, if you know how to fold fitted sheets, you've got to be one of the wisest people in the world because I can't do it. I said, I think my wife's seen it a couple of times. And she told me that the writer of the book was going to be there on Monday. And then she said this, Oprah wanted me to call you and get permission to use your email on the show on Monday. I hadn't written anything in the email that I would be embarrassed about, so I said, no ma'am, you can use my email if you want to. That Monday came along and just for the record, I was watching the Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> you would have been watching too. There's two chairs on the platform, and they're a good distance apart, and this uh, Oprah comes out, the crowd goes crazy, and then this man, she introduces him, this man comes out, half the crowd cheers for him, half the crowd is booing and hissing, and they hate him and everything, and he sits down, and she says, well, we've gone through a lot, or something like that, and he looked at her, and I thought it was so smart, he quoted her. He said, well, you know, Oprah, I realize that many of the things that I said in the book have been true, proven to be untrue, however... The emotional truth of the book is still there. 
Oprah Winfrey looked at him, and this is exactly what she said. She said, I am very disappointed in you. There's no such thing as emotional truth. Everything is either true or it's false. It's right or it's wrong. It's holy or it's wicked. There's no such thing as emotional truth. The crowd began to cheer all over the place. I grabbed my wife's shoulder and I shook it. I said, I said that. I said that. That's my email. Do you know she did not give me credit? But I do want you to know for the record that I'm not bitter about that thing at all. (laughs) The truth is, there's only one truth, and His name is Jesus Christ. The truth is, the wages of sin is death. The truth is, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The truth is, there is none righteous, no, not one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no life without Him. There's a life, a a human life that appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth away. But the eternal life that you can have is only through Jesus Christ. But God commendeth His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then Jesus finishes up with one more dogmatic statement. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you're a lost person, the way, the truth, and the life is Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And if you'll call on Him, He'll save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. By the way, that's Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. That's Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, and it's Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. Three times God said it. If you'd like to know him today, you can. Nothing can stop you. The devil himself can't stop you. He can distract you, but he can't stop you. If you're a Christian this morning, Jesus is speaking primarily here to his followers who are going to face the greatest loss of their lives. And he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Oh, they were still going to have a hole in their heart when he left. They were still going to miss him. But his comfort is always there. 